thank you very much. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. And I would like to make this uh, session an interactive one. And uh, I will have prepared the PowerPoint and so on, but uh, I have included some uh, discussion uh, here and there. So please, hopefully you can enjoy. Now, I would like to start my session by talking about um, an, a moment in life anecdotes. Uh, it happened to me, well, there are many moments in life uh, which you don't forget, but once, the first one to me, I think, happened when I was 18. And I was a very good sort of a student of English, right? And I scored high. The teachers had to prepare a special test for me because I get perfect scores all the time. Now, uh, I was... I sort of got the scholarship to go to America when I was 18 and then went to the American high school. And I was so excited, uh, you know, um, 50 students from all over Japan and I was selected. And what happened though was that I went to the host family's house and realized that six years of excellent English learning didn't amount to much. <laughs> dog could speak better than, well, not speak, dog can understand better than I could. And I was so ashamed to say that I had studied six years of English to anyone else because European students, okay, okay, they, they're used to it, so I didn't mind that. Thai student, African student, you know, they say, oh yeah, one or two years, and here I was, most excellent student, the best student, six years, and I can't even express myself. What I realized was that what I was good at was English for exam, but not English for life. And I learned my lesson. I will not waste my time again for doing something which is ridiculous. And also, I will not, as a teacher, treat the students and then waste their time. And that's the ethos of whatever I do. So if you think that I'm talking about nonsense, talking nonsense, then please interrupt so that I will learn better and I won't be wasting your time. Okay, now let me start. Uh, the, the topic is a text-driven, task-based uh, uh, approach. Well, it sounds sort of complicated, but what it, what it is, is that I believe that we should be thinking about learning whether the students are learning or not, rather than we should be teaching this, this, this out of syllabus and tick, 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 and then have I taught this past form or not. Okay, it's important, however, unless the students are acquiring how to talk about the past events, what's the point? They may pass the exam, but they may not be able to express themselves. And there is a big gap, and that's what I meant by second language acquisition applied. Whatever we are doing should be helping the learning to take place. And uh, of all the uh, approaches so far, a lot of them are teaching approaches. And the, as for learning approaches, text-driven approaches, and then task-based language teaching seems to be the two of the sort of strong ones. So um, I, I would like to talk about them and demonstrate the materials and also talk about pros and cons about that. And hopefully you will find my talk useful for diverse needs and wants that you have because I, from what I, have, I can gather, you do different kinds of jobs. However, as far as learning is concerned, we do the same thing. Okay, now let me start. Krika. Uh, my yoga teacher sent me this video so I thought this, this will be a very good start. Oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah. 
It's a boy. <laughs> Okay, right. My question to you is that, is the boy likely to learn to hip-hop or not? If so, why? If not, why not? Please talk amongst yourselves. There are external factors and internal factors. What kind of external factors help? What kind of internal factors help? Please continue. Okay, can we get together? What kind of external factors would help him acquire or learn to hip hop? Being shown. Being shown, yeah. Daddy is showing the boy how to do it. And learning by doing. Learning by doing, yes, indeed. Having fun. Having fun, pleasure, yes. Being encouraged, yes. Not yeah, not judged. No fear of making mistakes. I think the key factor is the, the exposure. Yeah. It's a holistic exposure. The music, the dance, it's not yeah. just learn this. Yeah. Learn this. And there were so many repeats and then similar occasions. And then each time the, the kid is watching, learning, acquiring, trialing, etc. Yeah. Is uh, accepting the difference way, the different way that the, the child has. Do you know, That's right. It, it, it's not exactly the same way as the father's. Exactly. Doing. The father, it's regardless. Like yeah, the father accepts the creativity and the uh, individuality, and then the father accepts him. Social acceptance, bond, respect. And no correction. No correction whatsoever. Okay. No. He's still hip hopping, and that's it. You know, he's, he, there's no, there's no, oh, I'll make it simple. No, none of that. It, the father is simple. giving the direct, authentic, top level stuff, and then the, the toddler is just looking and learning. And I love the, the scene where he's thinking, and then he learns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're both really enjoying themselves, but it's not just the child who's enjoying yeah. himself, but you can tell that. Yeah, the sharing of enjoyment. Enjoy yeah, the things. joy, pleasure. Okay, so there is a rich and nourishing stimulus, right? And uh, the, that sparks off the curiosity. I want to know more. And the repeated exposure we talked about, and achievable challenge. So it is possible for him to do it, and he did it. And it gave him a lot of pleasure. 
and freedom for trials and experimentation, no fear for failure, praise and encouragement you mentioned, self-fulfillment, I've done it. And nothing is more joyous than I, I've done it, I've done it. Self-esteem, so success and social recognition. Uh, as the boy grows up, probably he will have friends and then he does the hip hop and then the friends, wow! And then that boosts self-esteem. He will autonomously learn more, want to get better and better. And also, we are social beings, feeling close and accepted. That's vital for our survival. Now, my next question is, your teaching and materials, are they successful or not? And if so, why? And do your teaching or does your material create the environment and then internal uh, sort of conditions for these things to happen? My experience, my personal experience of teaching EFL and Japanese is that there is a requirement of syllabus, assessment requirements, and also I teach with colleagues, so I can't just go, go out and do whatever I want. So I have to do the same thing. Standardization comes, and also there is an assumed methodology. If you're talking about covering the syllabus, then that means pre present, practice, and production, perhaps. There is a sort of a very strong magnet to that usual methodology. And, uh, well, especially in foreign language, mimic and memorize, and then habit formation seems to be still alive. With habit formation and establishing the neural networks, yes, you need the repetition, and you need the neural networks to be firing again and again and again. However, in the case of hip hop, the repetition was different each time, and repetition comes from the want, that the boy wanted it, rather than, oh, because of the exam, I have to remember this. There's a big difference there. And materials-wise, usual dialogue, that A and B talks to each other, A and B knows what's going to come, which is so unrealistic. And then grammar and vocabulary and others, as if if you learn the discrete items of vocabulary and grammar, you will be able to speak. Nobody does that. And students' diverse needs, wants, and capabilities. So we're always juggling how to help the weak ones and how to um, not bore the strong ones. When I was a teacher, on top of this, I had a conflict between my own EFL learning experience versus teaching requirements. As I said to you at the beginning, I didn't learn my English. My formal language learning failed after six years. So I didn't believe in the required syllabus and so on and so on. And I wanted different things. In fact, the best part of my e, uh, English language learning is that in primary school days, I loved John Lennon, Beatles. So I went to the, the films, I listened to the records again and again and again, massive, massive exposure, as if the hip hop case. It was a pleasure for me, massive exposure, repetition, autonomous learning, and so on and so on, and the self-esteem. And when I entered the, uni uh, the, the, the um, uh, English <laughs> classes in secondary school, I was far ahead. And that gave me self-esteem and confidence. That, that's why I scored very high. And it was just a game anyway. So I had a problem. I didn't believe in these. I believe in more learning-oriented approaches. And so I adapted. So from PPP to experiential approaches and supplementation, 
pick and mix authentic text and tasks. Am I right that all of you here do the similar thing in adapting and supplementing because you're not happy with what you get in the course books? But without the course books, you are worried about coverage of syllabus and so on, and also the assessment. Okay, so we have a dilemma here. There is a gap between teaching material and learning materials. And teaching materials, coverage of syllabus and assessment focused. Those, so director of studies will love the course books, teaching materials. And the teaching materials talks about knowledge about language. This vocabulary, plural form is this, and then the, the verb inflex is da 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 da. However, in real life, intake and acquisition, just because you gave the food, just because you gave the food doesn't mean the learner, learners will eat them, mm -hmm. right? So there's a big gap between input and intake and acquisition. And the materials should be ensuring this rather than that. And from syllabus, syllabus designer's point of view, you can't miss anything. Because if you miss something, then people will say, oh, you didn't cover that. Uh, choosing the two course books, oh, this coverage is good, good this one. So input satisfy the external teaching needs and wants, but not necessarily the learner's learning needs and wants. If the father of that hip hop, okay, today I'm going to teach you how to do this kick, and then will the boy look forward to the morning? Probably not. And awareness and communicative use of language. So, Knowing the language, I had a student who won the vocabulary contest in Japanese high school, senior high school, but he couldn't speak a word. So communication and then language knowledge, uh, passive knowledge, just doesn't gel. And if you, if you want to communicate, you need to interact. So. The course book talk about Jill and Jack. Good morning, how are you? La 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 la. It's transactional. Go to the shop, it's transactional. Be it Japanese language teaching, Italian, Spanish, transactional. Whereas people don't actually do the transaction, people interact. Hi, how are you today? What, what are you feeling? What do you want? Yeah, actually, you know, yesterday I had too much drink, so um, I want to da la 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 la. Course books, oops, course books doesn't prepare this. And the methodology wise, methodology wise, sorry, methodology wise, uh, teaching materials uses PPP because they're so worried about a coverage. Whereas learning materials, methodology needs a different approach, such as text-driven or task-based. Now, what are they? I'm going to demonstrate soon. My argument is, be it toddlers learning hip-hop, non-linguistic learning, or linguistic learning, the brain does the learning. Therefore, we need to create the optimal condition for our teaching. The problem is teaching does not equal learning. And if the materials are not catering for learning, there is a problem. Uh, so, how do we go about this? Uh, la last time, uh, Carmen Herrero, uh, you know, did a session uh, about videos and so on. Great materials are there. How do we make use of them and then create the learning materials? This is where material development comes in. So, if we have an SLA-friendly framework, for example, text-driven, task-based, 
for material development, adaptation, and supplementation, probably we will feel more confident about the likelihood of uh, the validity of our materials or adaptation or supplementation. Okay? That's my argument. And then the principles wise, uh, Brian Tomlinson uh, contribute, made a big contribution in a sense. He surveyed, he read uh, various uh, second language acquisition literature, and then he extracted that sort of a convergent views. For example, exposure to rich, recycled, meaningful, and comprehensible language in use. There you are, hip hop. If you take the language bit, there you are. Rich environment. And it was recycled, it was meaningful for the kid, and also comprehensive, doable, achievable challenge. Affective and cognitive engagement. In the end, you can take the horse to the water, but will the, will the horse drink the water or not? You, you need a desire. The desire, affective engagement, social recognition, uh, want, motivation, all that is crucial in learning. Making use of those mental resources typically used in communica communication in L1. The students are, most of us, right? Uh, unless you are teaching young, very young, 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 young uh, learners, <laughs> they have a very intelligent L1 system and the ways of doing things in life. And therefore, why not make use of that in second language acquisition? And noticing how the L2 is used. I mean, very famous sort of a, a, a Russian sort of a com a comprehensible import, and then all you need is the comprehensible import, has been, uh, you know, um, has been beaten, as it were, that you do need an explicit, um, motivated uh, attention to the, lang uh, to, to, to the language elements. Otherwise, you end up in speaking pigeons. So accuracy, sophistication, you do need the cognitive, explicit efforts. But again, learners should be motivated. It's not the teacher who bangs on. The, you have to be careful about that. That's different from the learner, that just like a hip hop boy, looking at father carefully and then learning, paying motivated attention. Uh, Okay, and then being given opportunities for contextualized and purposeful communication in L2 for real life outcome. What kills me with the teaching materials is that you have to write an essay or you have to do a presentation, not because they want to talk about it, but because it's a practice. If it was something that they are passionate about and they want to talk about it, and then somebody says something else, no, I believe, I don't believe in that. My view is that. Now, that's communication, contextualized, and also for real life outcome. We don't speak to practice. We speak to achieve effects, to get what we want. And then that element is missing in teaching materials. Uh, so those are the principles that he kind of, well, whatever, whenever he pro produces different book, it, it could be five, it could be seven, or it could be, but you know, these are the calls. Okay, an example from my EFL secondary textbook. Now, this is the flip bit that I sent you, uh, the participants, the, um, uh, text, and uh, that one was taken from a Belgium uh, secondary school. The reason why I chose it is because that is the only book, uh, Banden Branden 2006, is a collection of from young learners to university students, how to use the tasks, teacher training as well. So uh, even though it is 2006, very useful because you can see the actual example of task being used for education, not for SLA research. So anyway, I've taken that for the secondary school uh, level and intermediate teenagers 
European teenagers, intelligent, irreverent, not interested if boring. Secondary school in Belgium, and approaches is a task-based syllabus. Now, okay, so I would like you to become the uh, student, and then I would like you to listen to the teacher uh, read the uh, text. And I'm following the task, which is uh, listen to section one of the text, a gruesome performance taken from your textbook. So just relax. And then you don't need the uh, printouts. Just relax and listen and enjoy imagining, okay? Do you know the word fakir? Fakir. Fakir is a holy man, you know, uh, who are possessed of miraculous powers. Okay, right. So fakir, get that. That's the key term. All right, are you ready? Relax. A gruesome performance. Just before sunset, a fakir calls the passers-by to come and watch his performance. Seated in a, in, a, in a circle with torches, the audience watches the fakir take a length of rope from a wicker, wick, wicker basket and throws it in the air. He repeats this action a couple of times to demonstrate that it is an ordinary rope. But then, as he throws the rope into the air again, it suddenly coils up in the darkness until the top is no longer visible and then miraculously stay there. The fakir's assistant, a slim young boy, climbs a rope and is seen to vanish into thin air. He ignores his, ma his master's calls to come back down. Impatiently, the fakir draws a sharp knife, clenches it between his teeth, and clambers up after the boy, and also vanishes from sight. Then there is a series of blood-curdling yells and various dismembered limbs of the young boy fall to the ground, followed by his head. The fakir then slides down the rope, which falls down behind him. He joins his other assistants, who are standing in tears around the remains of the young boy. They put the parts of the boy into a basket. When the fakir claps his hands, the young boy emerges from the basket, smiling, miraculously reassembled and with no apparent damage. Right? Now, so you've listened to the se first section. Have you had time to flip? I mean, judging from every, everybody sort of pulling out the stuff you have, what did you think? How did you feel when you read this text? Oh, wait, this time you listened to it, heard it. What did you think? <laughs> Uh, I cannot even think of a word. Ex I was uh, in expectation for what's go what was going to happen. Uh -huh. So I was interested in, in, in this. Okay. So, so were you kind of predicting well, how did he do that? Yes. Ah, okay, okay, okay. All of you? Yeah. Okay, I, okay. I just, as I started reading, remembered a performance, a similar performance I had seen in um, Palma de Mallorca when I okay. was uh -huh. So it was very, especially the picture of yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's a personal it connection. Members coming down, but <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that was a gruesome part. Okay, okay. All right. So, so you kind of liked the text, did you? Uh, what, Brian? I was going to say that sort of connection is key, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. 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 So, potentially. So text, yeah, exactly. So there is a potentially engaging element in this text, right? So potentially usable. 
All right, okay. So what kind of activities? I asked as a flip, what kind of activity would you use? Mm. You can ask about uh, uh, finding a conclusion to the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so, con conclusion. How yeah. Do do yeah. How yeah. did they do it? How did they do it? That's the thing, isn't it? And how would you ask the student? How would you, do, would you structure the procedure? Mm -hmm. Do you just ask, what do you think? What's the uh, trick? Yeah. Or, yeah. No? You could ask them to come up with a set of questions. Yeah. Okay, okay, set of questions, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, the engaging text tells you what to do next, really. That's the beauty of text-driven. Uh, by the way, just to, to make sure, in a nutshell, the text-driven approach, you read the article, right? Or have, yeah, yeah. If you have read the article, just to make sure, what is text-driven approach? Do you know? Talk amongst yourselves. Do you, have you heard of it? Just to clear the ground. Okay, okay, so what would you say? What, what, what are the characteristics of the text-driven approach? Starting point is? Text, yes. <laughs> what kind of text? Engaging, that's the crucial thing. Really engaging, intriguing text that you start thinking about it. Oh, how, how did that happen? Now, that's a very good one potentially engaging text. Mm. And then uh, what are the crucial ingredients that you have to put in the text-driven approach? Something personal. Yeah. Something personal, yes. And something, remember hip-hop? We well, relate to the experience of this experience. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, experiential, something experiential, something affective, cognitively engaging, etc., etc. Remember Tomlinson's five principles that we talked about? And uh, text-driven approach kind of sequence what to do first, second, third, but all in all, all together, satisfy those principles. That's text-driven approach. Any other comment? Uh, he's the originator, so he has a say. <laughs> Perfectly right. Especially <laughs> better than I could. Uh, I think one other key element, though, is that you're not looking for a teaching. You're not looking ostensibly for a teaching book. You haven't selected the text because it's got five past perfects in it. You've selected it because it's potentially engaging. And that's yeah. the difference with most course books. Where the text, I've been written many course books myself, you were told to select the text. Yeah, and uh, text types. Sorry, uh, text. Yeah. Oh, yeah, in the, yeah. In, in yeah. The combined approach. Yeah, but the main thing is it's, it's got to be engaging. And uh, when we say text, uh, uh, it, has, it should be authentic in a sense that it's written for communication, not for language teaching. And another thing is that text could mean cartoon, video, just music, anything. Anything that stirs us. 
And that's the text driven. Okay. Yeah, that's No. The text is very much a stimulus yeah. for communication. Yeah. That's something that people have misunderstood. That's true, indeed, yeah. yeah. OK. Mm. And uh, what about the task-based? Uh, what are the key ingredients? What is important? What's the characteristic? number one characteristics? Task-based. Yeah. Set up something which has got a, a, an outcome which is not That's right. linguistic. Exactly. So the, the learners are going to be engaged in the task and they have to solve something, they have yeah. to do something yeah. with the language, but it's not. That's right. That, like, you know, uh, cooking a dish. That's the task. Or achieve a model plane, or, um, you know, um, do anything which is not linguistic, non linguistic outcome should be there. And uh, it, it is an extension of a communica communica uh, communicative approach. And then the thing is, the student may be focused on the achievement of the real life outcomes or game outcomes, but the teacher may have a linguistic or communicative uh, objective, i.e., uh, asking questions to each other, or argument, or you know, ask, uh, asking for clarification, collaboration skills, problem solving skills, etc., life's soft skills, and so on and so on. So teachers are very aware. So the task is a tool to, uh, for, for the students are focused, but the teachers are focused on both things. And then assessment should be uh, how effective this outcome is, how valid, good the outcome is, which is different from typical language uh, assessment. But obviously, how eloquent it is, depending on the task, how accurate, accuracy and eloquent, uh, how eloquent it is, that sort of thing could come in as assessment criteria, but it depends on the kind of tasks and the kind of object objectives. Right. Sorry, you yeah. mentioned that we did an analysis, I think, of 10 course books of their production activities. They all had output, but not one of them had any outcomes or tasks. Yeah. They were just told to have a conversation or write an essay or mm. write a story. But mm. for what purpose? What were they trying to achieve? It's yeah. just not there. Exactly. And yeah, in real life, we don't talk mm. to just to talk. There is a real life outcome or the effect that we want to achieve. Teaching materials never have the real life outcome. It's not contextualized. Jane and, and invites somebody to a party. What for? What, what relationship does this person have to you in real life? You see? So involvement of self is not there. Whereas hip hop, was, 100%. OK, in, so the last question is hopefully outcome of this session. And will you be able to use the text-driven, task-based in your everyday teaching or not? So hopefully, after today and after one week, you start to think, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. But one thing that Brian said a while ago, that uh, text-driven, for example, go for the uh, um, engaging text, not as a language. So if you ha have to cover certain language points, then how do you sort of deal with the task-based syllabus or text-based syllabus? We will discuss that later. OK. now. So let's look at the original. I mean, you haven't got this, but if you look at the actual book by uh, Banden Branden, there is a task in that uh, uh, for the text. So the question is, as you said, how does this work? How do you think this miracle can be explained? Spot on. The text asks that. So the good question. However, the next. Here are a number of possible explanations. Which one do you think is the correct one? 
The fakir has magic powers, da la la. The fakir is, in fact, an extraordinary hypnotist. The fakir uses a trick. The thing is, why give multiple choice? The, what, what happens to the students' discussion? Without this, the students' minds are active. And then they would want to talk by giving this, oh, yeah, mm, I see, period. Terrible. What's so task based about this? And the continuation, after taking the answer of your choice, ask your neighbor whether he has chosen the same answer or another one. Yes, All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably everybody chose C anyway. Mm. Maybe the, uh, so maybe the, the objective was not to get the students' thought in that case, but to test um, reading comprehension. In that yeah. case, the students have to understand sure. um, multiple choice or chunks of reading sure. of text. Yeah. And they still have to do something. Sure, yeah. But that's a teaching purpose, isn't it? Have they understood the text or not? It's not teaching purpose, it's a testing purpose. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So you ask that open-ended question, how, how did they manage to do this? Then you will not only be stimulating conversation and interaction, but you also find out if they understood or not. Just, <laughs> but what that does is give the teacher the opportunity to use it as a test. And if you talk to publishers, they say that's what we have to do. We, there, there are very few open-ended questions in course books. They're closed. They're closed and there are 10 questions so the teacher can use it as a test. And, and testing dominates the classroom. Yeah. Well. yeah. Well, I think also the open question allows for more possibilities. Yes, that's right. So yeah. it creates more of a discussion within the class, but also it allows for the students to be more creative. That's right. Not as prescript prescriptive. Um, so I think the open open question is and far is, more yeah, potent. And if, you, and, 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 if you, and if the purpose of the, of the task is to generate discussion, conversation, or, you know, uh, then as a teacher you have to be open to the possibilities or the many possibilities of, exactly. of an answer. Exactly. Yeah, you, you get silly creative answers. Like I was thinking of some students who were saying, well, he's got a twin brother. Yeah. So they chop one kid up and another. <laughs> That's creative indeed, yeah. But the interesting, I mean, the interesting thing is it makes me think of my four-year-old, right? I mean, you give them something and they just go run off yes, with it. Yes, run off with and, it, yeah. You know, and at the same time, it sounds really silly to you as an adult, but then as a child, why not? You know, yeah. so I think... But silliness is yeah. extremely useful in exactly. language acquisition. That's yeah. a, a yeah. theory called yeah. the Bizarreness Theory. The only problem of open uh, answers is that classroom management wise, where do you go next? And everybody's wow, 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 wow. Well, actually, I want to teach this one. <laughs> and they, I, I have another great activities. Students are going wow, wow, wow. So there is, there is a problem. That's where, again, material development, you can pre-plan uh, and then kind of sequence and then stage the activities. Uh, I hope to show you in my example. But ultimate one is the one. Who is right or who is wrong? Find out by reading text opposite. The thing is, the course book, when you see the section one, section two is there. Yeah. Anybody who haven't, you know, I can imagine my student don't listen to me at all and then just go there, oh yeah, yeah, ah, okay, okay, period. So there's no mystery whatsoever. Terrible. Okay, so evaluation of original task. Let's look at the rich and recycled meaningful and comprehensible language in use. To what extent are the tasks likely to help the learners to be exposed to a rich recycled. Well, 
you only listened to the text once, right? And then there was no reading, actually. The text, there's no instruction to give out the text. So really, only once. And then, oops, sorry. And then be affectively and cognitively engaged. The text was, but the activities put it off, as it were. And make use of the mental resources. Problem solving? Yeah, bring on. That's what's exciting for the four-year-old kid. And then multiple choice is not suitable for teenagers. And notice how L2 language is used. No, you, you just focus on the meaning. There was no sort of a focus on the language either. And then uh, contextualized uh, purposeful communication for real life outcome. Apart from uh, guessing what the trick was, there is no real life outcome. Okay, so there is a, even though it's called a task based course book, it uses the text, which is potentially engaging, but it's really a text-driven and task-based, but task-based bit fell flat, mm -hmm. that one. Yeah? So you've heard us mention that the mental resources. Uh -huh. Two of the mental resources we use in the L1 are visualization and inner speech. Yeah. And the evidence is in an L2, unless you're at a very high level, you don't visualize and you don't use inner speech. Yeah. So one thing I would do is when, say, listen to this story and try and see in your mind what is happening. Exactly. And then at the end, talk to yourself yeah. about how you think they did it. The yeah. Groups they so yeah. Stimulating. Yeah. Well, text-driven stages has that experiential stage, and then before the learner listened to the text, I intentionally didn't tell you what to do mentally. But if you, the teacher tells you, now, you are going to listen to a very scary story, try to see pictures in your mind, then you are more likely to visualize. It's just a strength thing, what you now normally do. OK? So uh, gruesome performance, we have discussed it. And for those, having those sort of uh, principles will help you to sharpen your evaluation uh, from the learning point of view. And then I would argue my proposal is material development framework, which is designed in accordance with language learning theories. If you have that, then when we adapt it or supplement it, we can evaluate, use the same evaluation criteria, have I done it or not? OK, it's pre-use evaluation, but it gives a structure, criticality, uh, in evaluating your own materials. And obviously, when you use it with the students, and uh, whether the students are engaged or did the tasks, and then uh, as one of my um, MA students last year did, and then uh, she got the, uh, uh, if I may boast, um, uh, postgraduate uh, MA thesis, British Council, a marriage she was given. But anyway, what she did was to record the classroom interaction using the text-driven materials and then PPP material, course, usual coursebooks, and then compare the TAN taking and TAN initiation and then count the numbers and also look at the quality of the actual interaction of the students. And then text-driven learning materials were far superior in the content and the interactions. So if you are talking about language learning, that's the sort of uh, condition that we should be creating, right? OK, so example of adaptation supplementation of a gruesome performance. I'm going to uh, exemplify uh, what we might like to do. A minor adaptation based on that particular part uh, just listen in mind. The te teacher could gesture it, but better, you are the fakir. You are the assistant, you know. I mean, you do, you do them all. You're a, you're a, uh, magic, uh, you're a fakir, and therefore you have to do all the actions. And then when the assistants appear, then you have to be the assistants. Okay? 
So, the, so when I read, then you have to act it. You have to not only visualize it mentally, you have to physically do it, which strengthens the language and the whole body kinesthetic experience. That's one of the uh, improvements we can do easily without any extra effort. Individually, so firstly, mentioning that individually think about it, that creates a reason to form groups and then discuss. So interaction, there is a reason for interaction because you thought about it, you want to talk about it, you know, and then you want to see the differences, right? Just a simple thing. It's a matter of giving the instructions. And then after you have listened and then thought about it and discussed it, comes the actual text. And then each member in the group have to read and, whoa, this must be. They have listed the likely explanation, right? So they can eliminate or they can choose the most likely explanation by reading. So it's a deeper reading, purposeful reading, part of the communication. Task-based research uh, often is oral discussion about spot the differences between the pictures, that kind of task-based for research purposes is so boring. It's not educational. But anyway, the, another uh, adaptation you can do is, a, we can do is individually write section two, explanation of the tricks. So they have discussed the first uh, section, um, came up with the likely tricks, explanation of the tricks, and they actually write the continuation of it. So mystery, mystery explained. And they have to do it individually, well, maybe a bullet point, and then, or, or write it, and then in groups swap the drafts. So what's happening is writing and reading. Because everybody else, uh, you're, you, I would be interested in reading other people's, and they, choose one representative version of section two out of the one group. And then when the teacher invites, then the groups raise hands and then read out their version, okay? And you could sort of go on to the uh, language bit, like read the section two from the textbook. So the section two is given out. And this time, it's a comparison between what they have written and what the textbook says. And then compare the, the, so number eight is reading for content. Mm -hmm. Number nine is reading for the language points. Mm -hmm. So here, noticing the expressions and language comes in. And then you improve your group's version. And self-study, uh, the students write, revise the individual version, and then submit it. By the time they revise, their writing is much better, so the teacher can just read, oh, yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. You don't have to read pen it. And which is a no-no thing to do from the learner's point of view. Teachers waste time, learners waste time, hate it anyway. So why do it? Okay, so all these staging and sequencing, text-driven, 2013, Tomlinson has written about it. Wish I had written, but read Tomlinson, 2013. Highly recommended. But what I want to say to you briefly now is that we can do a more extensive uh, uh, adaptation. For example, a uh, major adaptation supplementation. And let's say you have sort of a four classes to spare. Obviously, this is a luxury, and then none of us will have that luxury. However, just for the sake of um, displaying or l listing things you might like to do, it's worth persevering with me. Okay, so period one. Uh, my view is that that text, the, the Fakir's text, is kind of actually difficult to guess how, how things happened. 
because it actually uses three tricks. One is a rope trick, and the other is the fakir goes up and then dis dismembers the rims and head. No blood whatsoever. That's very weird, but anyway, nonetheless, that's the second trick, right? And the third trick is, ta-da, the boy appears again. So how does that three tricks? And then it was very difficult for me to actually come up with the explanation. So what I did was to come up with this practice sort of a, you know, stage by stage, strengthen, empowering the learners in terms of magic trick. And uh, so period one is uh, subtask, a bit of magic. And then period two, subtask is your party trick. And then period three is subtask, party tricks booklet project. And period four is what I have explained before. And um, here, you will become the students. And actually, hmm, hmm. What do you do? No, I, I need a box of tissue. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, no, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. I, I, I will skip that because the time is short okay. as well. I would have been able to surprise you. However, I'm not able to, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but anyway, OK, let's do that. OK, you are students. I will be the teacher, OK? Hi, students. How are you? OK, hi, everyone. Now, today, I'm going to show you a video. And have you ever heard of the um, name Tommy Cooper? Tommy Cooper. Well, who is it? What is he? <laughs> eh? Eh? Tell me. Magician. He's a magician. Yes. Mm. And also, his day job was? Magician. Comedian. That's right. Yeah. He was a standard comics and very funny guy. Uh, but the thing is, the he is, he was a president of a, magi a magician's uh, association, but in his stand-up comedy, you never know whether he will succeed or not. That gives a thrill, and then that creates the funny moments. But anyway, let's look at it. Tommy Cooper. Hang on, ladies and gentlemen, I share this one trick now. For the gently bars or bays, I will now produce a bouquet of flowers. A bouquet of flowers. <laughs> 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 a bouquet of flowers. God <laughs> 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 okay. No. Do you do you know of any magic trick? Can you do any magic trick? No? Well, do you have any party tricks? Maybe cross your eyes or something. <laughs> okay. Now, would you like to become able to do some magic trick yourselves? Interested? Mm, okay, okay, okay. Well, actually, uh, I'm going to show you... Um, you know, like when you have a party, and then after, at the beginning it's really wow, 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 wow. And then after a while it starts to go, sort of die down a little bit. And then you say, well, actually I can show you some magic trick today. And everybody's eyes opens up. And then you can be the star. Now, I was going to do the trick. <laughs> and uh, tissue, the box of tissue, well, I, I, I couldn't get it. So... I, I looked for it in the York, uni, uh, York uh, station, but I couldn't. But anyway, never mind. I will show you a video now. And uh, this is, you need to guess the trick, okay? If I rip it up and 
squeeze it. If I squeeze it really hard, if I squeeze this ball really hard, a little magic occurs, and the paper, the paper is able to be restored, just like that. So I'll show you how to do that. For this trick, you are going to need Right. How did he do that? Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Right. Okay. So, we are going to find out Two pieces of yeah, you uh, knew it, didn't you? It's going to need to be crumpled up, and it's good if it's really durable, not like regular ones, kind of a little harder. But this, if you just crumple it up a lot, it'll be nice and easy uh, to use. So you're going to take it and you're going to crumple it into a ball. Uh, the way I like to do this, I just tuck it into my hand just like that, so I leave it out. And uh, the secret to this trick is it's going to be behind the pure child the whole time. <laughs> okay, so what do you think? Now, I would like to ask you, uh, by next week, you are going to learn the trick, find the trick in the first place, learn the trick, and then next week you're going to do the presentation. Okay? And then that's a group task. All right? Now, so uh, let me uh, uh, explain what I did for the uh, subtask one, the period. This is one period. Uh, readiness activities, if those who have read the article may recognize the name. So readiness activity is not a, a warmer, but the a video of Tommy Cooper was meant to prepare you for the actual magic trip. And especially, I was going to perform it 
live. And then sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't succeed, just like Tommy Cooper. So I just wanted to break the ice by Tommy Cooper. So it was a very important preparation and also to give them the atmosphere, relax them, informal atmosphere. So readiness activity is to prepare your mind and also the whole student being uh, for the learning. And then Tommy Cooper's birth trick came, and then I talked about the party tricks. Would you like to learn a party trick? And then you said, why not? OK, that's a good start. And then comes my performance, experiential uh, activities, uh, which is teacher's demonstration. Well, in my experience, when the teacher does something live, it has really strong uh, sort of a power that affects the student and the relationship uh, between the teacher and the student becomes so stronger, so I found. I don't know why, but. And then video is one thing, but doing it live is different. And then, uh, OK, do you want to know the, and then you discuss why, what's the trick, and then do you want to know uh, how I did it? then watch this video. So you create a reason for watching the video, and then you watch the video. And so after I have performed it, intake activity is, you saw me do the magic, imagine, I, I, imagine I did. And then you are remembering it, and then you talk about your personal view, how did she do that? That's the intake activity. And then, uh, it's a text driven is flexible framework, so I added another video of torn and restored paper so that by then they have watched and looked at various sort of a repetition. There's a repetition with different focus and different magic tricks, right? And then comes the YouTube video and announcement of, well, next week you're going to do it. Suddenly, oh, I have to do that. And so they will have to uh, use a mobile or computer or whatever, resource center, and then they have to prepare it. And then the teacher says, well, I'm, I will be available if you need, uh, need help. But normally teenage students don't need them because the teachers, uh, they can do better than teachers. Right. And then they will prepare it if they have to, to to, to present it in front of the peer. They don't want to make fool of themselves. They will really, really watch and listen and probably write the script. They look at the captions and then learn the, learn the language and so on. There you are, language acquisition there. Uh, so that's the first uh, subtask. And then, because they have done the uh, presentation, the group project, uh, they are, oh, so, so they have done the uh, internet search, preparation of the pre presentation, and, and uh, group presentations follows. And then you give the criteria for marking, assessment marking. Is it entertaining? Is it clear? Is it impactful? These are very good real life skills for real life outcomes. And option, they can actually create the YouTube video and upload it if they want to. They can do that. It's really real life. And then followed the subtask three is that they have performed it. Now they have to write it as a booklet. And then they, they go through the peer editorial for content peer editorial for language, and submission to the teacher and the class discussion. So the teacher don't have to look at everyone's, all the groups, and maybe pick up the good ones, and then blow it up on screen, and everybody contributes to correct. So rather than teacher red penning, the students correct themselves. Because it's a good example, you don't have to correct every mistake. So in that way, you save time, and it's more powerful. Self-esteem, all these principles covered. And then setting the booklet, 
uh, task-based assessment, you assess the effect of outcome, i.e., if it's allowed, they can sell it, and which sold better. You know, that sort of thing could be part of the criteria for marking. Right, and then comes the gruesome thing, which we, I discussed. So what do you think? So you evaluate the adaptation. And hopefully, I have score, you know, this example scores higher than the original one. So we know that what we're doing matches the second language acquisition principles. So now, why hybrid? Why text-driven and why task-based? Uh, the strength of the text-driven is that in, it's input-rich. You know, the magic thing, the video, we laughed, we enjoyed it, right? You may forget what I talked about, but you will remember the video, right? So that's the power of the input. And task-based, Michael Long, who is a strong proponent, and also he proposed the task-based in a modern sense, but originally it was 1985 uh, Prabhu uh, and procedural syllabus, but even before that, communicative approach, or even before that, nursing and all sorts, task base was around. But the thing is, they were so, uh, Michael Long, 2015, was so much into interaction being the source of comprehensible input, he said, task, not text, but ignoring the great power of input, the text, is silly, to say the least. Don't waste my time, Michael Long. And interaction rich, unless something that you read or heard or experienced is engaging, you're not going to talk about it, would you? If the text is so boring, what is there to talk about? So having the great input, engaging text, will help the interaction to be rich. And then uh, SLA researchers uh, have written so many task-based books. However, they talk about cognitive engagement and language learning, but they don't talk about human affective engagement at all. Unless a horse wants it, the horse is not going to drink water. And therefore, you have to create the desire that the student wants to do it, like a hippo, hippo boy. So there's a big problem in the current version of task-based. So OK, so men, you know, visualization and so on, if the text is strong, Yes. Task-based, depending on the task, yes. But a lot of tasks are routine tasks which is not engaging at all. And the noticing, that's a big thing for both. And then giving opportunities for uh, contextualized and purposeful communication, L2, for real life outcomes. Now, I think text-driven is stronger than the task. Depends on the task. And the task has been trivialized. You need a great task like party tricks and presentation, and then being able to actually do it in your life. OK, so that's all I wanted to say today. And I want to uh, give to you uh, uh, my favorite um, uh, saying. The Italian novelist in The Guardian uh, interview said this, a language is a compendium of the history, geography, material, and spiritual life, the vices and virtues, not only of those who speak it, but also of those who have spoken it through the centuries. Why do writing of somebody moves us to tears, you know? It's because <coughs> there's life and blood behind those words, right? 
The words, the grammar, the syntax are a chisel that shapes a thought. Just a tool, right? But, and this is uh, Elena Ferrante. Yes, I'm Italian, but I'm not loud. I don't gesticulate, gesticulate, and I'm not good with pizza. But anyway, and what I want to say by introducing this thing is that the syllabus, curriculum, materials, assessment seem to be currently dominated by utilitarian approaches to language teaching in which language is treated as a mere object to be taught, practiced, and assessed. The language is light there. There's nothing, no blood, no sweat, no tears in them. As a result, the text and input that learners receive seem so impoverished. The task could become meaningless chores. No wonder learners are not motivated. Uh, these days, we seem to be living in a world when words don't mean anything. Just watch the TV news. And blatant lies and empty promises are accepted. That's terrible. And in order, it is, so is it not our job as a teacher that we need to ensure the quality of input and methodology for the sake of self-actualization through genuine communication of our thoughts and feeling in our provision? And just, we're not just teaching the grammar, we're not teaching the stupid dialogue or vocabulary. We're teaching the power, we're giving them the power to express themselves, become aware of themselves. And then through that interaction, we learn ourselves as teachers. And that's the sort of teaching, that's the sort of <laughs> learning materials I want. And Every time I use uh, the adapted materials, it's open. There. It's sequenced, but it's opened. Therefore, I get inspired by students' creativity. And I wish the textbooks that we select are made of that. If not, we should be adapting, supplementing, or writing our own materials. Thank you very much. Questions? Any interactions? Oh, yeah, syllabus. It's all very well that learning, uh, so, so, I mean, in text driven, you collect the engaging text and then create materials. So, well, how does that linguistic syllabus and the text driven or task driven syllabus get along? Because it's based on teaching materials learning materials. And you know, you, we are working in institutions. And here, I would like to invite Brian. Uh, he did the Namibian project with the Ministry of Education and so on. And they, we had this conflict. But in that particular case, the government was so enlightened. There you are. first task in groups, well first of all we developed, that's how the text driven framework developed at that workshop, we developed it on the first day. And that task was go to the library, find a text which you think will engage 16 year old kids in Libya. Bring it back, read it, or listen to it, experience it, and then tell each other what happened in your mind as you were doing this. And, and then that just as you did at the beginning with the hip-hop, when you said things like, oh, 
as I've listened, I was thinking, right? and that becomes a task. So they then develop tasks, a uh, text driven approach with tasks. And I kept saying, don't just forget about the thing. But every night, I went back to my hotel room, and on the wall, I had the two dead syllabus. And I did a match between what they produced and the syllabus. We wrote a complete course book in six days using this approach with this teacher, writing into ten groups of three. On the last day, on the, the fifth day, looked at my match and we'd achieved, I think it was a 92% match with the curriculum. Because I told them we needed a, a variety of genres and text types. That's the key thing. Variety of genres and text types. 92%. If, if, if you've only got 50% match, there's something wrong with the syllabus, because the syllabus would actually be teaching things which aren't actually useful or needed. You've got 92% match. The next morning, I went to the ministry official and I said, look, we've achieved 92% match. These things we haven't managed to cover. Do you think they're really important? One was the third conditional. Mm -hmm. And he's a very enlightened guy. He said, maybe you've got a point if the third conditional hasn't really come up. And how useful is it? We'll drop it from the syllabus. Mm -hmm. So we had the opposite effect. Our materials influenced the syllabus. There were a couple of crucial things, which first thing, so on the last day, I just said to the teachers, "Go oh, look at your unit. See if you could fit this in naturally. Don't force it in. See if it will fit in somehow." And then we achieved 100% match with some of us without trying. Because everyone, that's the objection everybody comes up with. Oh, it's all very well for you, but we have to follow some of us to do it that way. It can be done. Mm. And another what we had was a textbook full of incredibly engaging text. Which got the syllabus. If we'd done it the other way around, yeah. started with the syllabus and then looked at the text, we would have used it. Mm -hmm. we, we broke all the taboos with ministry permission. We had a unit on drugs. And we, asked this, we, asked, we sent a questionnaire around all the schools to 15 year old kids. What do you want to read about and talk about in English? And we, sent, we asked the teachers. The teachers predicted all pop music, football, all fashion. The kids didn't come up with that. Well, they came up with drug abuse, um, marital violence, um, smoking, teenage pregnancy, all the taboo topics <coughs> which British publishers would not touch. So they were all engaging topics. No preaching, no, no morality. The, the one on drugs, there was, a, it started, there was a cartoon character called Heidi, who was a sort of naughty but nice kid. And in this unit, she says to her friend, you tell your mom you're coming to my house to do your homework, I'll tell my mom I'm going to your house to do the homework, and we'll go to the club. And we go to the club and take drugs. And, ah, shock, horror in the classroom. And this, this is the readiness activity we need to begin. And there's a song, there's a story, there's a debate, all focused on, on drugs. And, um, uh, so not only did we Match the syllabus, but we managed to be, I think, effectively. Mm -hmm. One of the teachers, I've been very quick to tell me I'm taking over. One of the teachers was a Norwegian. She went back to Norway, became a publisher, and published the best textbook we've ever seen mm -hmm. called uh, Search, isn't it? Yeah, Search and Searching, and that at yeah. the moment yeah. they revised it. And they took a point also about East. Mm. Uh, when people say, you're always attacking the course book, you know any good ones, that's the one. Very difficult to get, unfortunately. Mm. Now, talking about uh, collecting the good texts, why not involve the students as well? Mm -hmm. When I taught the Japanese, the, those mm -hmm. strong students were avid readers of Japanese manga or animation or technological stuff or computer games. Mm -hmm. And then if they can bring the texts and then somehow we can develop it or the stu ask the students de to develop it as tasks, then probably uh, the material would be even better than what we can produce. So that's one suggestion I, I, 
I, I would like to try if I teach Japanese again. Uh, another point is that uh, much in the syllabus, that's a great idea, uh, like task-based <coughs> or text-driven. Um, task-based was created as an alternative <coughs> a syllabus uh, to the linguistic syllabus. So why not have the task-based syllabus or text-driven syllabus in the first place? <coughs> but the colleagues, how do you persuade your colleagues? Now, <coughs> forum is where you get to meet the colleagues. If you have like-minded people, you can start with a supplement. So find a great text. Well, actually, I have this one, and I've created this one. Oh, yeah, that's very good. I mean, let me tr use it next time. And then you swap. If you have three or four people, you already have four or five units ready. And then you can try it out. You can uh, improve it. And then there you are. You are leading towards the text-driven or text-driven task-based uh, uh, syllabus. And if all the colleagues, you know, the four colleagues all do it, then you can actually create the assessment based on your materials. The assessment cannot, does not have, it's very easy because what you need to do is to create the parallel tasks or if you have, say, six units of supplement, text-driven, text, um, text, uh, text task-based, then you can use one as assessment. See? Or maybe two as an assessment. So there you are. And you can try out by teaching. And then you can, uh, after you have taught, you're very confident that, you know, and then you, you, you set it as the uh, sort of uh, actual uh, exam tasks or portfolio tasks. And then they can do the search and so on, so on, so on. And then the final product, there is a criteria that you, you set yourself and then the student know the criteria, they will work toward it, and then you can control their learning. You can control the backwash of the exams. So in that way, you can use the tests as a learning opportunity, learning incentive as well. So it's not that difficult. And then the materials, all I needed to do is go into the inter uh, YouTube, and then magic, and the magic revealed. Mm. Presto, it's amazing. There are so many of them. I couldn't deal with it, you see. And uh, Carmen Herrero was talking about foreign language films and so on. Just let the students do the kind, that kind of task. And then you'll be amazed. And then you have all the collection. I tell my students that if you find a great text or video, just let me know. I'm, I would like to share it. And then I give, you know, I use all sorts in my class, and then students like it, so they come and let me know, and then, you know, we, we exchange. We have a community of text lovers with the students. Yeah. Has anybody heard of the Parliament Project? Ah. P-A-L-M. No. Austrian Project, yeah? Well, it's basically Austria, but it's a European Parliament. Mm. Mm. In, I think it's something like 32 languages or more. Mm -hmm. uh, and all you've got to do is just, just Google Tom, P A L P A L M project. They're yeah. free, you know, easy to access. I, I think they made a mistake actually, and they produced the videos, they've also produced language activities for them. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the language activities, but a lot of the videos are very stimulating and can be used for the textbook. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could you say B L P? Palm. Palm. P A L M. Yeah. Palm. Yeah. And the students actually, yeah, what they did was to ask the students to create the video in collaboration with the teachers. And one of the video is Friendship Bench. 
and a group of uh, girls sort of act out how the uh, friendship bench works. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an ordinary bench that says friendship bench, and then everybody is playing around, but you don't have any friends to play with, so you just sit on the f uh, friendship bench. And then others notice, and then, would you like to join in? Mm -hmm. And then they join in. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And then it's the video shown there. And then the girl who explained, I was very lonely. Mm -hmm. And this is based on my uh, experience of, of an outcast. Very moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So please, please visit. Thank you for pointing that out. OK. <laughs> so it's 3 o'clock. Thank you so much, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your... Thank you. Thank you.